Um, you know, re originally I uh, began in the theater. That was my background was was doing stage work. I graduated from Cal State Fullerton with a uh, bachelor's in theater arts, a lot of Shakespeare, did a lot of like just performing on stage. And while I was there, um, I went out for an audition and it was to do a couple of like what uh, uh, a couple of character auditions over at Disney. Um, one of them was for a show called uh, Talk to Stitch. And the other one was for Turtle Talk with Crush. This was back in like 2005, around that time. And me not really knowing what I was getting myself into, I just kind of just went for it. And to me, that was sort of my first like venture into voiceover um, because the nature of what we do um, with those shows is very voiceover specific. Um, it's one part improv, one part, um, theater, one part voiceover, one part like digital puppeteering. So you have all these different elements and it was a great, great way to utilize what I was learning in my, my theater program at Cal State Fullerton and directly apply it like, you know, at the same time. It was, it was, you know, very rare do you get a chance to learn something and then almost immediately apply it in like a professional workplace setting. Um, because normally the, the natural progression of things is you go to school and then you graduate and then you go into, you know, you, whatever your given field was. And so this was sort of like me sort of testing that waters. And then, um, probably around 2008 was when I graduated and I quickly learned, um, doing some regional theater, uh, after college that unless you're on a national tour or on Broadway, you're probably not going to be able to make a living doing theater. I learned that very, very quickly. It is very, very difficult <laughs> to be able to support yourself. So given the training and the work that I had already done um, at Disneyland, it kind of just seemed like a natural progression. And I kind of I kind of thought long and hard and I, I kind of realized that maybe voiceover would be sort of the successful um, avenue that I could sort of express myself and, and pursue my love of acting um, and maybe actually make a living. Because the thing that's really tricky when you do anything like, say, on camera, theater, film, television, any of those other types of things is that you are very limited. Um, yeah. You are limited by your appearance. You 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 can only play what you, what you appear as by your age range, by your height, weight, ethnicity, all of that stuff. You are very bound by it. And one of the things that attracted me so much to voiceover was that there were no limits, there were no boundaries, there were there were there was nothing that could keep me from playing a, a wide range of characters. So um it was probably around 2011 that i really started getting serious and training and taking a lot of classes um drove out to la and took so many classes with some of the best voiceover teachers that that la has to offer and it took some time it took a lot of traction you know um i took my licks uh spent a lot of money spent a lot of time driving from Anaheim to LA and, and, and training and doing all that stuff. And finally I got my demos produced and found representation. And when you find representation, then it's a little bit easier to audition for, for gigs and jobs and shows and things like that. And so, um, I really didn't start really gaining any traction until probably about 2015 2016 around that time it it took a long time for me to kind of get off the ground um and that's just because the nature of what we do it's not as if there's a roadmap everybody kind of has a different um way of getting in breaking into voiceover um and so it's a little tricky sometimes yeah i mean the the expression uh, fake it till you make it comes up quite a bit and uh, you know the more i think about it the more apt uh it is uh, at least in my situation where it was just you know sometimes you don't know and, and sometimes you know you're 
you're still kind of just learning as you go along and and sometimes you just kind of you know like like the expression is fake it till you make it and you just <laughs> kind of have to there's there's a degree of kind of bsing your way through through things and kind of just learning as you go and, and you know you you make friends and acquaintances and and you know you learn from other people in your class not just through your instructor but you learn uh, the people that are around you and, and um, a lot of your contemporaries. Um, and that that's as valuable of a tool to have as any one, say, teacher. So, yeah, yeah just dive into the community and, and learn as much as you possibly can. Oh, oh God. Um, <laughs> that is tough. That is really, really tough. Um, again, my exposure to anime isn't probably what it should be. Um, you asking me that question, and it's tough because there's also like all sorts of like really good anime characters and really good protagonists that you could choose from. Like Goku comes to mind. He's, you know, like, you know, a hero's hero, really, really good guy. There is this one show, it's an anime. I don't, I think it was a sub, not a dub. But I remember seeing it. It was one of the very first animes that I saw. It was called Detroit Metal City. And it was about this guy who was like this like Marilyn Manson rocker kind of a guy. And he was like really into like death metal and stuff like that. And like he had this like very public persona. But like deep down inside he was very like emo. And like he would always like play his acoustic guitar and stuff like that. And like so if you watch that that uh, series it was about him leading this like death metal rock star lifestyle but also like deep down inside he was like just like this wallflower and like very sensitive and like very caring and nurturing and stuff like that and like there would be times where he was like trying to like wash away from like the death metal image and like that crazy insane satanic rocker and he would like try to do stuff and like try to come out to people and be honest and like be open and like something would go wrong and people would think oh my god like he's insane he's crazy he's like he's even more evil and demonic than what we originally thought his rock star persona was so um the fact that he was just constantly in this like state of being misunderstood it's something that i really really appreciated at the time i had watched some anime uh when i was growing up when i was 13 you know that's kind of when the toonami block really kind of came to and I, it was kind of funny because Toonami at that time wasn't a Saturday night thing, if you guys remember. It was kind of like an everyday Monday through Friday, but it only existed from like, I want to say from five to seven. It was like at, at like in that mm -hmm. window. And for whatever reason, like I would always catch Dragon Ball Z. And I think it was kind of at that weird point in time in my daily life, like in middle school and in high school, where I had just finished having dinner but I hadn't begun my homework yet. So like, that was kind of like the, the beginning of like my anime exposure. Um, I, I'm probably not as big of an anime fan as like some of the other people that, that work regularly in it. Um, but I have found animes that I, I do love and, and it is something that I really appreciate as an art form. And, and even now more so as someone that does work in that field, um, I really, really have a greater appreciation for what goes into making um, those shows possible. I'm very, very proud of the work that I did on Jojo, Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Um, if you watch this most recent season, uh, I was on Golden Wind and I played the role of Pesci. And that was just a great, great, great character to kind of dive into. Um, I had no idea what I was going into. I hadn't read the manga for that, so I wasn't familiar with the arc. And in fact, when I got the role, I ended up kind of reading up on him and kind of getting a sense of who he was and his trajectory and his arc and all that stuff. And at one point they kind of like, were like, no, don't do that. We don't want you to know too much about your character. We want you to just kind of be in the moment and, you know, be present and, and forget about, you know, like what happens and all that stuff. So, you know, they kind of like 
shamed me for that a little bit. <laughs> um, but it was great to, to play with this character because if you're familiar with JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, everybody's very macho, everybody's tough, everybody's like very serious and like very intense and like everything's very deep and like, you know, very like, you know, like very cool and very badass and all that stuff. And my character, Pesci, I don't know if you've seen him, um, he has like this weird kind of turn up head um, he, I mean, he's, he's like kind of the derpiest one of the bunch. Um, and you know, he's a very, very sweet guy. He's kind of like the run to the litter. Uh, if you think about like the entire group that he's, he's in, like everybody else are like assassins and he's kind of, like I said, like kind of the derpiest one. Like I'm going to show you a picture of him right now, but this is, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, the one but, with green hair, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. But, <laughs> like I said, he's he's got oh. this like, really just weird looking um, appearance about him. He has like really no neck. There's nothing like he's just so and he's such an oddball character. Um, and like I said, everybody else in the group, like they're like these killer assassins and like they're mm -hmm. hitmen and, and like he's kind of just like the little runt of the litter. And so vocally, when you're trying to um bring that out you know how do you do that in a world that's so real and grounded and very cinematic but you i mean looking at his face looking at his appearance there is a little wiggle room for making him a little comedic and he's he's kind of the butt of of a lot of jokes and so vocally playing with the director um when we were trying to find his voice you know you you kind of just feel it out a little bit and we kind of discovered that he has this sound where he kind of just is in this constant state of like maybe constipation. You know, like maybe he's got to go number two the entire time and you know, he's just kind of nervous and doesn't really know. He, he He's kind of unsure of himself and you know, he kind of doubts himself everywhere he goes. Um, and so getting a chance to play this guy who, like I said, was kind of the run to the litter. And then he has this arc, uh, which is actually very subtle and very beautiful. And one of the things that I, I loved exploring about it was this guy who had been kind of made fun of and, and like I said, talked down to and, and looked down upon. And he kind of realizes his own worth and realizes his own confidence and realizes, you know, he is powerful in his own right and, and all the things that he can do. And it, it's, you know, it makes you think, it's like, oh my gosh, what if he had had that nurturing environment? What if his the people around him had been more encouraging what he could have done at the beginning as opposed to the end? So again, you know, you find those little arcs that you can explore with the character. Yeah, very, very proud of that work that I did with him. It just depends if, you know, um, sometimes, uh, like I'll give an example right now, like, I had a bunch of auditions that came into me, um, like say yesterday, that are due Monday morning. So, like you're as a, as a working voice actor, you're constantly auditioning for things, and I'm gonna say 99.9% .9 of the time you will not book what you audition for. That's just it's an it's an outright numbers game. It is daunting between the anime and the video games and the commercials and all the other things that are going on. Um, you just audition as much as you can, and then when you do end up booking a job, it's actually kind of like winning the lottery in, in a certain sense, because it's like, oh my gosh, what I've done, all the work that I put in, like somebody actually noticed, like Senpai noticed me, like this is this is actually something that's like, oh my gosh, like I get to do what I want to do and somebody's going to pay me to, you know, do this, this is great. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's just constantly auditioning for work. And then sometimes, uh, you know, it's like, hey, when you do have work, you know, sometimes you have to block out like chunks of your day. And it could be an hour, it could be 30 minutes, it could be two hours, it could be three hours, it could be four hours, it could be something like that. Um, and so, you know, you have sessions. Right now during COVID, I'm able to record from home. So that's uh, a nice sort of a convenience uh, given the nature of what's going on in the world right now ordinarily I'd be driving out to LA. So not only do you have to factor in the time that is spent um, actually doing the session, but you also have to factor in the drive time and, and the commute and all that stuff, which isn't that big of a deal, but you know, it's just, it's something that comes with the territory. 
Um, and so you have to be able to manage your time with respects to the auditions and the auditions that are coming in and, and the work that you hope to do. And when it does come in, being able to successfully do it and do it to the best of your ability, and then maybe kind of have something of a personal life, try to, try to have, uh, you know, have a family, <laughs> you know, or have a day job, have something that kind of keeps you afloat because, you know, sometimes, especially anime, unfortunately, does not pay as much as it probably should. And so, you know, it's just, it's this constant struggle of just trying to keep it going and trying to um, go on to the next role when it's done. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm so lucky to be doing what I'm, I'm doing. And there are times where, you know, it's, it, it's really remarkable and there'd be times where, and I hope none of them find out this out, but like, I would pay them to do some of the, you know, video games, or I would be paying them to do some of the anime and the commercials and like, like I'm, I'm just as much of a fan and I geek out about stuff. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really lucky to be doing it sometimes. It, you know, when you've reached the point where you're actually working on something, when you've been cast, um, there is some wiggle room, but there also isn't. Sometimes, you know, they like what exactly what you did in the audition. And obviously that what you did in the audition is what they want you to do on the show. Um, other times it's more of a collaborative effort. Like I said, sometimes there's, they still like whoever the director is, or maybe the, the people that are producing the anime, they might not 100% know what it is that they want. So again, sometimes there is a back and forth uh, process that goes into sort of finding out um, the character's voice and their mannerisms and, and who they are and how they fit into the greater scheme of things. And so as an actor, you kind of just have to be prepared and you have to be able to adapt to whatever is thrown at you and whatever situation you are thrust into. Um, and again, it all starts with writing. If you have something that is very well written, and whether it's a video game, a commercial, um, a cartoon, anime, whatever, if it is well written, it will make the director's job easier. It will make the actor's job that much easier. Um, and and if you don't have something that is that is very well written, it makes your life a lot harder, mm. a lot harder. Oh, dang. And yeah. then and so. So it would make it a lot harder because then it makes it difficult to see like what is the picture like they're trying to figure out for that character. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know, as an actor, you have to go into a situation when you're working on a character, working on a show, and sometimes you don't know, you don't know what's going on. Or maybe you don't know what the show is, or maybe it's a new show, or maybe you don't watch that anime or whatever. So you kind of have to be very proactive and ask, you know, sort of the given circumstances, the who, what, why, when, and where of what is going on and what is the world that we're living in. And, and, you know, does it lean more towards one style or this style? Is it very realistic? Is it not very realistic? Is it over the top? Is it grounded? Um, and again, you just kind of have to ask questions and that's why you lean on your directors. That's why you ask questions to your writers and, and so on and so forth. And, and also as an actor, it also helps to, like I said, do your homework, you know, find out what the, you know, who's writing it, find out, you know, where it's coming from, find out what other fans have said about it. And it'll, it will kind of give you an impression as to who your characters are, or what their relationships are like and, and, and what other people think of it. So it, you know, the more knowledge that you can get, um, before you even go into the booth and start recording, uh, to me, I feel like that, that will make your choices that much better. And like I said, when you have something that's well-written, it allows your director to be as specific as possible when they are directing you in the booth. And so I'm a believer of if my director gives me specificity, I can give specificity. I can, I can, I can meet them halfway on that. But there have been times where I've had directors that are just like, just do it. Just make it happen. Go for it. And again, you don't know what's going on. Is the person that you're talking to 
two feet away from you? Are they 12 feet away from you? Are they 20 feet away from you? So again, those are the types of little minute things that will influence um, your performance. And it, uh, it's important to know everything you possibly can about what's going on. Um, probably watching a lot of TV. <laughs> I watched a lot of TV, watched a lot of movies. I was, I'm not gonna say that I was a latchkey kid, as I don't think that's entirely true. But looking back on my youth and my childhood and my upbringing, I spent an awful lot of time in front of the television. Now, that's not to say that I didn't do very good in school, because I did. I, I made very good grades and, you know, I graduated with honors and all that stuff. But I also spent a lot of time um, in front of the TV and watching movies and, and you know, was, uh, uh, you know, cartoons and everything that I could. And so I kind of soaked that up like a sponge and you, you take it all in and now as weird as it sounds, I'm kind of appreciative of all that as, as bad as it probably was for maybe my upbringing and my development. Um, and I'll give you an example, say for, for example, you're auditioning for something. Sometimes what the auditions will call for, they'll reference, Oh, Hey, um, this character is kind of like this person from that movie. Or he sounds like, you know, that guy on that one show 10 years ago, or he's kind of like this, this person, that singer or that, that rock star or that, 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 so again, it's, it pays, it is fruitful to be knowledgeable about as much of the entertainment business and media and music and movies and pop culture as much as you possibly can, because again, that's sort of what what is being directed at us and it'll help give an actor um a better impression of where they're going with with their performances yeah it's it's very interesting when you look at the trends that have gone on um in animation and anime and video games just the last 15 20 years i mean in, in, even if you step back a little bit further and look at the past 30 years and see what voice acting was like back then in like say the early 90s to what it is now it almost doesn't even resemble what it was back then i mean it was just like it's it's insane when you look at the trends and how much things change and shift and the tones and the themes that go on so again it is worth your while to be very very present um and very aware of like where the industry is going and where it's at right now. I'm, for the most part, I'm in a pretty good place. Uh, there have been times where it has been difficult, where I have had um, bouts of depression. Um, almost four years ago to the date, my wife and I lost a pregnancy. And so we were, we were halfway in we were about 25 weeks in and we had a miscarriage and it was very, very rough on, on both of us in our, our relationship, especially considering that that was our first pregnancy. And so you go from thinking that everything is okay. And, and, um, with, within a very short span of time, you go from wanting to have this baby and, and, you know, planning things and baby showers and all that stuff to, Hey, something is wrong to now we have lost your son. And it's a very, very tough thing to deal with. Um, I can tell you that the, the depression was definitely real and it was, it was weird because psychologically I knew that I wasn't in the right in, in my right mind, I wasn't in my right space. I knew that there's something was wrong because daily tasks that would ordinarily take me two or three minutes to do were now taking me 30 minutes. And like, logically, I can tell you that something is wrong with that. Like, like on paper, that sounds very, very wrong. Something is, isn't, isn't right when that's happening. And so how do you deal with that? And so I ended up having to go and, and, you know, get some therapy, seek some counseling, do that. 
Um, and, and it takes time and it is, is very rough because as you know, Heather, you know, I work at Disneyland. So you go back to work and what do you see? You see children, you see happy families, you see people smiling and all that stuff. And so it's one of those instances where you don't know if you're okay to go back to an environment like that. Like you just don't know. And you don't know until you actually do it. And there are times where... I realized I probably went back a little too soon or maybe you're not entirely healed. You're not entirely where you need to be to, to, to do things. And it's just tough because, you know, sometimes little things will set you off or you'll see something or somebody will say something and not that it, anything's being maliciously directed towards me. It's just the nature of being at an environment at a theme park where there are families and kids and, and all that. And you just, it just is something will hit you. And so, um, you know, that just takes time. That just takes time. And so that was definitely something that I dealt with for the better part of, I'm going to say a year or so. Um, I, I, yeah. And, and it's, it's tough to deal with. And my heart goes out to people that are dealing with stuff like that on a regular basis. anime there's there's so i mean just the nature of the medium of what it is there is so much that you can do with it um as far as exploring different characters different types of characters different worlds um different scenarios different everything and so why wouldn't um mental and emotional health be one of those topics that you can tackle with a character or an arc or an entire show or a cast or whatever um you know, there's there's almost a responsibility, I think, given given just the nature of everything. So, I mean, and again, I'm not the most well versed person when it comes to um, just the 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 knowledge of all the anime that's out there. Um, there have been a couple that people have said, oh, you know, that's really good, uh, a really good show about dealing with this or a really good one about dealing with that. Or there's, there are some that are feel good shows, you know, kind of those slice of life type of shows that, you know, again, will lift your spirits and all that. So again, there's a couple of different ways, ways that you could approach it, that you can tackle things, um, like that. And, and so, yeah, I think there's always more that can be done. growing up, uh, you know, in junior high and high school, watching a character like Goku, especially when you look at, at like the very first version of Dragon Ball versus like Dragon Ball Z, you see a character mature, you see a character grow up and have his own family. And he's, you know, the goodest of good guys that you will find. You will not find a more noble type of a hero. And that's always great to, to watch that and see that. And it's actually really when you think about a lot of the characters and a lot of the superheroes and a lot of things that you'll find right now in most tv shows you really don't get that many pure honest to goodness noble superheroes nowadays most of the the heroes that you get i guess i should say are flawed or sometimes they're anti-heroes or sometimes they're there's something going on with them where you know, they're not as much of a shining star as they they could be. And I get it, that's that's a choice and that might even be like a trend. But when you were that age, it's great to see a character like that. Um, and, and to a degree, not to, to get too far existentialist or hippie or anything like that, but it's just great to see a character like that that has such a that is such a straight arrow and that has like this great moral compass when you're that age and it gives you someone to look up to. Self-care, like I said, therapy, um, reaching out to friends and family. Um, and it, it's tough because, you know, that's a very, very specific tragedy to, to face. Um, and so, when you do find someone, and, and fortunately I was able, I shouldn't say fortunately because it sounds awful, but I was able to find a coworker that had went through a very, very similar experience. And so I distinctly remember going out and having breakfast with 
this coworker and her husband and you know my wife came along and we just talked and we it was great knowing that you're not alone mm -hmm. and that that right there already you know helps so much by knowing that you are not alone, that you're not the only person to go through it. And it's tough when you're going through something as specific as this, and especially with with a miscarriage and losing a child like that, that's something that doesn't really get talked about as much as it probably should. And um, there's this weird sort of a stigma that maybe is, it isn't taken as seriously. Um, just that's, that's kind of what I kind of get sometimes from comments that I see on Twitter and on Facebook and, and people's reactions to things. If you guys remember, Christy Teigen uh, lost a baby, what, three months ago or something like that. And some of the, the responses that I had seen from people were very callous and very cold. And, and it, you don't know what an experience like that will do to you until you go through it yourself. And I know that could be said of any sort of major traumatic episode or, or incident. So again, the best you can do if you've never gone through something like that is just try to empathize. Um, that maybe it's just, it isn't as big of a deal as maybe what it, what it actually is. Yeah. You know? Or, 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 you know, or are you looking for attention or is it, you know, is it really that or maybe it's a phase or, um, you know, something that I saw something the other day was like um, depression is a choice, which, you know, I do not agree with, you know, but again, yeah. you see people that they'll say things like that and that sort of marginalizes and it, 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 um, it trivializes what people go through in those types of situations. It's, it's really, really tough. Um, voiceover fa or uh, uh, anime fans are some of the most passionate people that I've met. Um, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough to go to conventions and meet so many fans and they're really, really great people. And it's great when you're able to see that something that you've done has touched someone and resonated with someone. Um, and it, it's tough, man, because the anime community has gotten a lot of flack for being very toxic and it's it's tough you know and and you know it's it's almost not fair to generalize like that because then again you're also committing the same error that'll that a lot of the people are doing themselves so it's like don't generalize um and, and don't tear people down man that's i don't, I don't know what to say i, I just, just you know and and it's tough because i think when it comes to a lot of the negativity and the stuff like that that I see on Twitter, I think for the most part, people are very, very supportive. I think people in their nature are very, very supportive of one another like that. But unfortunately, with what we see online, it's just those select few that kind of get the most attention. And those are the ones that really hurt or those are the ones that really, you know, spew that venom and all that stuff. So it, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to deal with.